Hi, folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast, Season 14, Episode 5. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we go. Great to have you with me to, well, let's let's talk about money, shall we? That's what we do here. And uh, you know what? It's about 50 degrees here in my office. I've just been a guest on uh, another podcast with my good friend Catherine Morgan of the uh, In Her Financial Shoes podcast. So I'm really, really hot. My throat is really dry, but you know what? I still love doing this. Anyway, I'll just quit complaining. Let's get on with it. Let's talk about risk because risk is an essential part of investing. And I think we need to say right off the bat, risk is a good thing. Okay. Now we are conditioned to understand that word risk as a negative thing, usually because it's a risk of loss of some kind. In today's show though, I want to enforce the exact opposite of that. The risk actually is a good thing and needs to be harnessed. So that's what we're talking about today. As usual, after the main body of the show, we'll uh, read a review and look at what we're going to be talking about next time. Before all that, though, remember, this podcast is brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They continue to sponsor the show here, been helping me out since 2011. Super grateful to them for doing so. Really could not have built this to what it is without their help. Also, um, check out the uh, self-invest website that they've built, which is branded Meaningful Money. That's at meaningfulmoney.tv slash podcast invest. Slightly weird link I know, but it just means I can track where people are coming from. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash podcast invest. 7IM themselves are at 7IM.co.uk. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Now, risk is something you're going to need to get to know if you're going to have any success building wealth as a new accumulator. In fact, not only are you going to need to get to know it, you're going to need to embrace it. Welcome it like a beloved family member who brings you really great presents. Weird metaphor, but you get the idea, right? We need to cozy up to risk a little bit, find more out about it. Then we need to, I think, slay a particularly persistent dragon, just to mix our metaphors, um, one which is linked to risk. And uh, I brought in a friend uh, to help me do that, slightly different format today. So remember, notes, links, all the good stuff that you need for today's show, meaningfulmoney.tv slash n. A5 stands for New Accumulators, Episode 5. That's the name of this season. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash NA5. Let's have a look first at what you need to know. Okay. Risk is multifaceted. Okay, nice word. I've dealt with risk at various points along the Meaningful Money journey, and it, it takes many forms. When most people think about risk, they think in terms of investment risk, which in a nutshell is is the risk that you'll invest in something and then lose money as a result. It's obviously way more complicated than that. Inflation risk is another kind of risk, and that's the risk that you'll lose money by not investing due to the ravages of inflation. Inertia risk is another one, uh, the risk that you'll miss out by doing nothing. It's kind of the technical term for FOMO, right? If you're not young enough or cool enough to know what FOMO is. Well, I'm not either, but I do know what it is, okay, because I've got teenage kids. There are many factors and many different risks, which are just how life works, right? It really is everywhere all the time. And because of that, we need not to fear it, but just learn to accept that it's there and understand its part and its role in life. More than that, though, we need to understand that we can actually use risk to our advantage. It's a lever that we can pull to make our own lives better in all kinds of ways. From an investment standpoint, risk makes you richer. It's as simple as that. The more risk you take with your investments, and I'll qualify that in a minute, the more risk you take, the higher the likely return over time. Of course, it also means that the risk of potential loss is higher, but we'll see that that's actually more about you than about the investments themselves. So there's quite a lot to this whole idea of risk. And, uh, but really, I think for, for the purposes of your investing journey as a new accumulator, think about risk when investing as how much the investments you hold will fluctuate in value. And I'm going to call that volatility because it serves our purposes. There's 
going to be all kinds of risk and finance nerds listening to this and going, oh, oh gosh, what a terrible oversimplification. Risk is not volatility. I know, but you know what? I have an audience and you don't because I have a good way of explaining this stuff. Risk for the purposes of our exercise when it comes to investing is about how much those investments go up and down along their general upward trend, right? Generally speaking, investments which are more volatile will end up making you more money over the longer term, but the ride can be rocky along the way. I challenge anybody to dispute me on that, All right? So risk is a really complex area. It's multifaceted. But for the purposes of our uh, talking about investments, let's talk about volatility, the risk that your investments will go up and down in value and to what degree. Second thing we need to know, and really we need not to just know this, folks. We need to just like imbibe it somehow and live by it. A loss is only a loss when you sell, right? Let's, as we think about volatility rather than risk, right? If we call it volatility, we need to remember this golden rule. Um, a loss is only a loss when you sell. Say it with me. <laughs> a loss is only a loss when you sell. If you think about it, let's say you invest £20,000 and a year later, you get a statement through the post and it says your investment is now worth £15,000. Clearly not a great day, but have you lost any money at that point? This was Instagram. You'd be looking at one of those yes, no polls right now. The answer is, is no, all right? Because if you look at the number of shares that you hold in whatever fund it is you own, it'll be the same or maybe a little bit higher than the number of shares you originally bought. You own the same amount of stuff. It's just that right now, it's worth a little bit less. But only if you sell them. They are just as likely, more likely, in fact, to increase in value in the next calendar year than they are to fall again. The only way to absolutely guarantee that you lose money is to sell those shares while they are worth less than you paid for them. It's obvious, really, but we forget it all too often. And we really need to watch our language when we talk about this stuff. Make sure we're not calling something a loss when it isn't. Really, we should call them temporary declines or something like that. Problem is, is that's a lot more syllables and a lot more letters than loss, right? But really, we should say a temporary decline only becomes a loss when you sell. And this is a good time just to reiterate one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I've come across it only recently, actually, but uh, some of my colleagues, people like um, Andy Hart of Maven Money, Nick Lincoln, uh, more on him in a minute, from Money Hat Tip, they say this stuff all the time. But this is from Nick Murray, a legendary American advisor. And he says, declines are temporary, but the advance is permanent. And here, Mr. Murray is talking about the relentless advance of stock markets over time. Yes, they will pull back. They will fluctuate from time to time. That is normal market behavior, but the general trend will always be to increase in value. All right. Third thing we need to know, that risk really is about behavior. So if it's true that a loss only becomes a loss when we sell, it stands to reason then it's behavior, not the market then, that causes those losses. It is our decision to sell at the wrong time that crystallizes a potential loss, a temporary decline, into a real one. Of course, it might be that we have to sell at that time due to circumstances beyond our control. And that's why you'll always hear me or any other sort of financial professional really say that your emergency fund plus any money that you see yourself needing to spend in the next two or three years, that shouldn't be invested at all. The whole point of that is to prevent you having to make that loss, to crystallize it by selling assets at the wrong time. If money you're going to need is not invested in the first place, then that's fine. You can just spend that money and you don't have to crystallize any losses because there won't be any. I'm going to spend a couple of weeks talking about behavior starting in episode seven of, of this season, which is the week after next. It's a subject that uh, I've dipped into here over the years. But in episode eight, I've got a superb interview with a gentleman called Neil Bage, founder of behavioral consultancy and a software company called BIQ. And uh, we really dig into some of the specific biases that we bring to the table we invest on um, um, uh, when we invest. I'm looking forward to bringing you that one. Watch this space for that in about three weeks. All right. So behavior really is the factor uh, determining whether we lose money or not. But I would put it to you that 
The only risk that matters, really, is the risk that you won't meet your financial goals. All right? I absolutely love this quote uh, from a book that I haven't read. <laughs> the book is called Adaptive Asset Allocation by authors Butler, Philbrick, and Gordillo. Uh, I'll link to it in the notes. And it uh, doesn't sound like a riveting read, does it? But I probably should read it from a professional point of view. But I love this quote. You ready? The only benchmark that you should care about is the one that indicates whether or not you're on track to accomplish your financial goals. Risk is measured as the probability that you won't meet your financial goals. Investing should have the exclusive objective of minimizing this risk. I absolutely love that. Investing then isn't about avoiding risks because they're inherent in the process. Actually, it's about harnessing them, those sort of subservient smaller risks to avoid the biggest risk of all which is that you don't meet your potential and that you miss your financial goals we need to sort of write this on our hands or tattoo it on our foreheads or something where we can see it we need to be backwards so we can read it in the mirror you know write it on a post-it note and stick it to your laptop so you'll see it whenever you're logging into your investment we need to understand the inherent uh, the inherent volatility of markets and obviously in turn your chosen investments within those markets accept them as necessary as we march relentlessly towards our goals, all right? Risk really is a big subject. Can't do it uh, justice here, but I wanted to preach a little bit, so I hope you don't mind, um, that really it's about behavior and it's about the ultimate risk of all of not actually meeting our goals. So now I want to do something that I don't think I've ever done before, which is to mix a sort of lectury preachy bit <laughs> with an interview. So I'd like to introduce you to my friend and colleague, uh, a man that I much admire called Nick Lincoln. Nick has been a financial advisor since 2001. He set up his own practice called Values to Vision Financial Planning in 2008. And he produces a fortnightly podcast called The Money Hat Tip. Very, very funny guy, actually. Uh, I have been known to laugh out loud while walking the dog listening to Nick's show. Um, he is known for his strong views about how advice has been and how it should be delivered in the UK. Our mutual friend Andy Hart, Maven Money podcast, he calls Nick his work dad, which should give you some idea of the kind of respect that people hold uh, Nick in and, and deservedly so. So I called Nick and said, uh, can I get your view on uh, capacity for loss, knowing that it would be fun? And um, capacity loss is, for loss is, is traditionally closely linked to attitude to risk when it comes to the financial advice process. Certainly the regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority, are making a lot of noise about it at the moment. Uh, advisors need to be better at understanding it. But let's see what Nick has to say. Nick, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? I'm good, Pete. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. Where are you uh, speaking to us from this morning? Uh, this morning, I am in my home office in Watford, WD17, my, my Don't give us real the rest office. Of the postcode. Hmm? <laughs> Don't give us the rest of the postcode. No, 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 that's enough. That's enough. That's <laughs> close enough. Uh, my, my real office is in, is in Radlop, which is uh, about uh, five miles away. So I'm, I'm heading down there after this. Well, I appreciate your time this morning, my friend. Now, I heard you present. Uh, it was Andy Hart, a mutual friend of ours, and uh, at his Humans Under Management conference last November, which is a conference for uh, financial advisors primarily, but focusing very much on behavior. And you gave a powerful talk um, specifically dealing with the concept called capacity for loss and your strong views on it. So given that I needed to deal with risk and capacity for loss, uh, in this current season of the podcast, I thought, you know what, I need to ring. You know who I need to ring? That's got to be Nick. So <laughs> I wonder if you can, first of all, just under outline what your understanding is of, of what capacity for loss is, maybe from the regulator's point of view, but then also, you know, your views on it would be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So um, my understanding of what the regulator means by capacity for loss, and, and this, by the way, is one of the issues because I don't think anybody can really define it properly and, and nobody can really... Um, thereby quantify how to, how to measure it on a client-by-client -client basis. But I think the regulator is saying capacity for loss is how far someone's investment portfolio would have to fall in value before it had a material effect on that person's standard of living. Okay. That's, that's my understanding of the definition. Is that broadly sit with what yeah. you think of it, Pete? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. It's, uh, yeah, it's about yeah, their ability to withstand losses. That itself is an issue. But um, what, what issue do you have with it, essentially? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think it's a re I think it's the defining issue of our times, and there are two there are two reasons why I think capacity for loss is fundamentally flawed. 
The first reason is that it completely ignores the real risk that nearly all of us face. In fact, everybody faces, uh, especially people coming into retirement with a three-decade retirement looming up, which for most people is going to be the time scale involved. And that real risk is inflation uh, destroying the purchasing power of whatever pots of money these soon-to-be retirees have built up. It emphasizes this, this notion of loss in the investment market to completely takes the focus away from the real risk, which is inflation. That's the first problem I have with it. And the second reason, which you'll understand, Pete, as a practicing advisor, a highly esteemed practicing advisor, um, is that <laughs> there, is, there is no loss. There is, markets never lose money. If you define loss as a permanent loss of capital, then over the last 150 years, no developed stock market has ever suffered a permanent loss of capital. Human beings suffer losses mm. because they sell at the wrong time. Markets don't cause losses. They have temporary declines. And so we're fixated on this, this, this word loss when actually what losses are there? So it's a, it's a two-pronged thing, I, two, two issues I have with capacity for loss. Yeah, that makes sense. And that isn't just semantics. It might be easy for somebody just to say, oh, well, you know, we're just niggling about vocabulary here. But uh, it, it's obviously correct that a loss is only a loss if you no longer have access or the ability to regain uh, money that you formerly had or assets that you formerly had. Mm -hmm. And of course, while the money remains invested, then you do have the ability to regain a, a previous high or previous level of the value of your investments. Whereas if you convert those investments back into cash and sort of sit weeping over your losses, then you are the source of them. And so it isn't just sem semantics. It's extremely practical. Now, in your talk, you, um, you emphasize specifically about those in retirement and really... Mm. Yeah, you're right. It is a defining issue because we're turning on on its head the the f sort of formally accepted dogma that people needed to take a lower level of risk in retirement. And why hasn't the regulator really got this yet? I well, okay. The flip answer is that the regulator is staffed by people who have defined benefit pensions <laughs> and they don't need to worry about investment risk. They don't understand cap. And the more serious answer, I don't, I generally don't think they understand capital markets. Um, I also think that all of us, including that's the regulator, all of us from, from the moment where we're, we're numerate, we, 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 we go to school, we learn maths, we, then we become adults and read the news. We are taught that risk is in the stock market and that cash is safe. It's just, it's every, every, media outlet, every source of information reinforces this message. Mm. And it's wrong, but it's, it's massively countercultural to push back against that. The, the real risk for the majority of people is not being in equities, but yeah. it's really hard to, to unwind people mentally who for 30 years accumulating money have been told the stock market is risky. And as you approach retirement, you need to de-risk and go into cash. Mm. What we need to be saying to people is, by all means, if if you're approaching retirement, go into cash. If you want the purchasing power of your pots of money to be destroyed over the next 30 years and for you to run out of money, flee to cash. Mm. But it's such a countercultural message that people, you know, we have to be really passionate about hammering this home again and again and again. Yeah. And that's why you're here, bud. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because I know this is um, a, a passion of yours and it is of mine as well. I feel like uh, we need to sort of bang this drum uh, even more. And you and I both have a platform that we can do that, both with our clients and, of course, on our respective podcasts, which I'm going to uh, bring up later. Um, it's, of course... So one of the sort of messages that you get, and, and again, it's, it's part of even the teaching of advisors, is that, well, okay, well, people in retirement, they, they can't make back any losses. But that's just the same thing again, isn't it? It's not really losses. Yeah, exactly. I mean, whether you're eight, eight or 80 years old, you only incur permanent loss if you capitulate to the, and forgive my phrasing it, to the financial pornography that accompanies every catastrophe of catastrophe. Mm. Permanent loss is only incurred when you sell, and it's, it's nothing to do with age. The reason why it can become more of an issue in retirement is that people in retirement will be living off their investment portfolios, drawing down on them to fund their lifestyle. And in a 30-year retirement, you can count on probably five or six times when the market will suffer a, a decline of 20% or more. Mm. And what you don't want to be doing in those periods is selling down your portfolio. Mm -hmm. The answer, there's, there's, there's no, I can't say there's some special serum that gets around that. I would say put some of your portfolio in cash, have a buffer, and draw down on that for those two or three years when the market goes from a peak to a trough. Mm. 
you know, be grown up about it. Maybe cut back on your spending for a year or two. Mm. You know, that's we, we we try and massage away risk with things like absolute return funds, which I'm sure you've oh, spoken wow. to to your listeners. You yeah. know, which which are just the the the, de- the, the work of the devil in terms <laughs> of investment. Um, you know, we need to be we need to have grown up conversations with grown up people who are retiring about mm. where the real risk is. And if you really cannot stomach a, a, a decline in the portfolio, in the value of your portfolio of sort of 30% every five or six years, then equities aren't for you, but appreciate that you probably will run out of money mm. before you run out of life. So take your pick. Your choice. Yeah, exactly. What about for those who are, what, this whole season that I'm in the middle of at the minute is called uh, new accumulators. So it's people who are getting started on wealth building, really. Mm. Is capacity for loss something they should give even a second thought about? No. <laughs> no, and I, no. As seriously, and any advisor who talks to accumulators about capacity for loss should be put up against a wall and shot. <laughs> there, it's and and I and I say this in my advice letters. No, I don't say it in my advice letters. I say it in in the back office stuff that clients don't see on the fact find. <laughs> um, the capacity for loss for the vast majority of people is enough for irrelevance. But especially for accumulators, they if you're if you're a twenty or a thirty or a forty year old, you want volatility. You want markets to go up and down like a seesaw because. As again, as you've explained in, in previous episodes, this thing of pound cost averaging, if you're dripping money in over a long period of time, you want the markets to go down because you're buying more of the great mm. companies of the world with each pound every time the market goes down. Capacity for loss for these people is utterly irrelevant, um, and it's immoral. I think it's it's immoral if you bring this up in front of those kind of accumulating clients. It's utterly nothing to do with them. You don't need to complicate their lives with this nonsense. So I had a client that I agree, by the way. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, to get that on my chest. Trying, yeah, 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 see what you feel, Nick. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I had a client uh, say to me recently, um, and it, it sort of brought me up short a little bit. I thought, I'm not sure I've done a good enough job with this, with this client in reinforcing this message. So this is a, a gentleman within spitting distance uh, of retirement. Hmm. Um, and we had a, uh, an update recently. I actually don't manage any money for him. It's a planning only client, which is not the usual. But mm. um, he said, you know, he watched the markets decline in quarter four, 2018, 10, 12% off, something like that. Got it all back by the end of quarter one, 2019, pretty much. Yeah. Um, but he said, if it had been a 30% decline, I think I would have struggled. How can we help people with this? Because, you know, they... I mean, can we, particularly those who maybe don't have an advisor, how can they f- make sure that they don't misbehave their way to poverty in this way and make these mistakes? Yeah, that's a really good question. And this answer is going to sound a little bit self-serving because I have thought about this. I, I don't think the vast majority of people entering retirement with a, with a nest egg that they have sweated decades to build up that is invested in the capital markets, I don't think those people without an empathetic, caring advisor will be able to withstand market volatility as we know and expect it to occur and that we want to occur. Mm. Um, and, you know, Dal- Dalbar, uh, for, you know, the Dalbar studies, which uh, for, your, for, your, for your listeners, Dalbar is an American company which monitors the US stock market against the returns that investors get in that stock market. Now, it's not the same thing as investment fund returns. Dalbar actually manage or monitor, rather, what the investors actually get by looking at when, when people go into and out of the markets. Okay. And as you know, Pete, over for, for decades now, Dalbar have been doing this, and they show that investors constantly get less than the market would give them if they just stuck their money in the S&P 500 and stared out of the window and did nothing. Hmm. And this, 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 this occurs both in rising markets and in falling markets. So last year, the S&P 500, the American stock market, the great companies of America, it fell by 4.4% okay, over the calendar year. Dalbar, their research showed the average US mutual fund investor lost over 9% wow. just through poor behaviors. I imagine they probably went in, a lot of these people went in in sort of August time, October time, because the market was doing well. We've had a very good, almost 10 year run. The market, as you mentioned earlier, went off a ledge in December. And these people didn't have an advisor to say, don't do that. Don't panic. And they panicked. Mm. So I think it's really, really difficult, a self-serving answer. But I think our value 
most of the, the, the fees that I charge my clients, I say to my clients, most of that fee is going to be about stopping you making the big mistake. It's about mm. behavioral management being there to, yeah. to stop. You know, when your mouse is hovering over the sell button <laughs> yeah. on, on, on your platform of choice, it'll be me saying, you know, it's me between you and stupid. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> nice um, and, but I, I do think to answer your question, to wrap it up, it's no good telling clients, in the middle of a horrendous bear market, don't do it. You you, ha- you, you have to inoculate them all the time. So now here we are, you know, a, a, a decade on from 2009, fantastic market returns. Mm. I now more than ever am telling my clients, you, listen, we're going to have another period of volatility. There's going to be the next crisis. You, you know, just pre, pre-warned mm. is, is forearm. You, you cannot put the, you, you know, when the boat is sinking, that is not the time to do the lifeboat exercise. Yeah, you, you're dead right. I, I couldn't possibly put it better than that, Nick, which is why I wanted you on here, mate. Um, I, I'm uh, smoking to myself because <laughs> just behind you is a message that you've written on your whiteboard. So, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm not going to say what it is because uh, you're going to have to watch the video, folks. But Nick, where can people find out more about what you're up to? Oh, if, they, if they're that desperate, they can find me on Twitter um, at Hat Tip Nick, and I do have my own, my own podcast called The Money Hat Tip, which is bi-weekly. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and it's great. It's highly recommended. For, I, I frequently laugh out loud to myself listening to Nick. Uh, uh, you're doing great work, my friend. Like, thank you for joining me, short and sharp, which is exactly what I wanted, and you've uh, delivered some great value, and people will, I'm sure, get the message from it. So thanks for joining me, mate. Really appreciate it. Uh, Absolute pleasure, Pete, and keep up the fantastic work. Okay, folks, uh, I imagine you're getting the the message by now, right? (laughs) Let me summarize. When it comes to investing, risk isn't what you might expect unless you spent some time listening to me here and and, and other people who propound this stuff. The inherent day-to-day ups and downs of the market are better described, I think, as volatility rather than risk. They are to be expected as part of the journey investing, and they are not to be feared. Risk, I think, is better described and better thought about as the risk of not meeting your dearly held financial goals, whether by making bad decisions, selling at the wrong time, or by letting inflation ravage your wealth over time. I hope that gives you some food for thought. Let's try not to be distracted by the conventional view of risk on our accumulation journey. You know, a view that I hold my hands up, I have probably spent a little bit too much time talking about the conventional view of risk and stuff like that. But let's instead focus on the end goal and use the tools that we've got at our disposal to get there one day, to meet our goals, okay? So I'm building on this, as always, the, you know, these seasons, I tried to make them build on each other. So we're talking uh, a bit more about this stuff and a bit more about the ha- behavioral side of things in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Review from Bingo Amino. Uh, who says, great podcast. I'm 18. Come on, 18 and listening to this stuff. I'm currently trying to plan my financial future. (laughs) Amazing. Before I found this podcast, I'd already laid out my budget and plans, but since listening, I've learned no end of things, mainly about investing, which before I found very confusing. Many thanks, Pete. Bingo, I mean, if you're listening to this stuff and starting to do this stuff at 18, you are going to be a very rich person one day, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you for leaving that review. Um, keep in touch, right? I'd love to know uh, how you're getting on. If you want to leave me a review, and uh, just like Bingo Amino did, if you're of an Apple persuasion, then meaningfulmoney.tv slash iTunes is a great place to do that. But wherever you listen to this show, if you can leave a review or a star rating, please do so because it keeps me near the top of the rankings. Since I recorded the last show, actually, Meaningful Money hit the number one spot in the business section of the iTunes chart here in the UK. Never been there before, got to number three. I think I might have uh, hit number two at some point, but never hit number one. Um, And that's down to you. So I'm really, really grateful. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for continuing to listen and spread the word. Leaving reviews is a great way to do that. So don't forget that um, I'll be doing a Q&A season to round off, sorry, a Q&A session to round off this season. So get your questions coming in about these, the challenges that you're facing when you're starting out as a new accumulator, building wealth for the first time. Send those questions to season14 at meaningfulmoney.tv and I'll answer them in the season finale, okay? Now next time we're going to be talking about real assets. When you're investing, Essentially, what you're doing is you're exchanging your cash, your money for stuff, (laughs) which will hopefully grow in value over time. And we need to talk about what that stuff actually is, because we 
probably should just call it stuff. It's a bit more serious than that. So that's it, folks, for this week. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Nick. Thank you again, Nick. Really appreciate your time, my friend. I hope it was helpful. I hope it's given you some food for thought when uh, talking about risk constructively. Any comments or questions, meaningfulmoney.tv slash NA5. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you next week.